Thank you. It's widely held that the post-September 11th world will never be the same. And there's no doubt that 9-11 was an event of historic importance. However, it's less clear how it's going to affect the uh, emerging framework of world power. Personally, I'm rather skeptical. I suspect that we may discover down the road that it has established more firmly tendencies that are already uh, underway and are rather deep-rooted. Well, to clarify the basis for that judgment, it's worthwhile to think about a few background issues, uh, in particular two questions, and I'll start with those. Uh, First is, why is it a historic event? And the second is, why did it happen? I should say that these questions themselves often elicit highly irrational reactions, as if seeking explanations and trying to place events in a historical context amounts to uh, what's sometimes called rationalization uh, or implies that the victims uh, deserve to be murdered. That's very common, but it's so outlandish that it's hardly necessary to comment, and I'll put it aside. It's a comment about the people who raise the questions. Other than that, not worth discussing. So first, why is it a historic event? Well, the answer to that is simple. It's because of the choice of victims, uh, not the nature of the crime. That much should be obvious to anyone who's familiar with the record of the past several hundred years, which it should be unnecessary to review. Uh, However, it may be useful, I think it is, to listen to some voices of the traditional victims reacting to September 11th. So it takes a Latin America particularly important to us. Our shadow has been cast there very heavily for a long time. Uh, September 11th atrocities were very harshly condemned, as they were virtually everywhere, but quite often uh, with a recollection of their own suffering. So in Central America, uh, perhaps the leading research journal is the uh, Journal of the Jesuit University in uh, Managua, They said the events of September 11th could be described as Armageddon, but added that we have suffered our own Armageddon in slow motion, referring to the atrocities of the 1980s, which was an international terrorist attack condemned by the World Court, as you know, and it would have been condemned by the Security Council if the United States hadn't vetoed it. And that was more serious than September 11th. Tens of thousands of people killed the country wrecked that may never recover. Uh, So yes, this may be Armageddon, but it's not new to us. Uh, In Panama, a journalist, a radio journalist, like others, bitterly condemned the September 11th atrocities, but added that we're familiar with it. Uh, He referred to the uh, attack, the bombing of the Barrio Chorillo uh, in November 19, December 1989, uh, when uh, Uh, The United States invaded Panama in that one bombing, according to Panamanian sources. uh, Several thousand people were killed in the poor barrio. Since it's our atrocities, we don't investigate, and nobody really knows the details, but it was certainly serious. Uh, uh, That invasion, that that was Operation Just Cause, uh, undertaken by George Bush I, in order to kidnap a disobedient thug, Uh, who was brought to the United States and tried and is now in jail, uh, sentenced for crimes that he committed uh, almost entirely on the CIA payroll. Well, they remember that. Uh, And others uh, refer to Operation Condor and the atrocities in the Southern Cone, again, international terrorism because of the U.S. involvement, crucial involvement. Uh, And others speak of the international terrorist wars of the 1980s, in Central America that left uh, hundreds of thousands dead, uh, millions of refugees and orphans, uh, four countries ruined. Uh, There were international Gallup polls taken after September 11th. Uh, Condemnation of the atrocities was near universal. On the other hand, there were very few places where there was much support for a military reaction. Some places in uh, Apart from a few places, it rarely went above about 30 percent, rather uh, legal means. 
uh, the kind of means that Nicaragua attempted to pursue but failed because they ran up against uh, a more powerful force, namely us, that wouldn't permit legal means. Uh, in Latin America, support for military action was the lowest. Uh, the highest in Latin America was about 11 percent in Venezuela and Colombia. Uh, the lowest was 2 percent in Mexico. Uh, the essential fact that lies behind this was described quite simply by uh, Carlos Salinas, who directed uh, government relations for Amnesty International for many years with particular concern for Latin America. And what he said is that Latin Americans know better than perhaps most people that the U.S. government is one of the biggest sponsors of terrorism, uh, and they know it from firsthand experience. Of course, it doesn't follow that innocent Americans should be slaughtered by terrorist gangsters, nor did anyone suggest that, uh, but uh, neither should other people, uh, and uh, the facts are not forgotten elsewhere. Well, let's move to another part of the world where happens it just was a few weeks ago, uh, Diyarbakir in southeastern Turkey. Uh, this is the same sort of unofficial capital of the Turkish Kurds. That's uh, 10 or 15 million people. Uh, they, had, uh, they have suffered uh, horrendous atrocities in recent years, some of the worst atrocities of the 1990s. Uh, several million refugees, uh, tens of thousands of people killed. Uh, hundreds, thousands, actually, of towns and villages destroyed, much of the countryside raised in Diyarbakir. Uh, there's nobody knows how many, but uh, maybe you know, hundreds of thousands of refugees in the uh, region right nearby, outside the city walls, uh, and living essentially in a dungeon, huge dungeon under terrific repression. Uh, uh, where did that come from? Well, it came from, from us. We paid for it. Uh, the, uh, if you take a look at arms transfers to Turkey, uh, Turkey was a major ally, of course, uh, strategically placed in the Cold War and near the Middle East, so it always got a uh, heavy flow of U.S. arms. Uh, it shot up, however, uh, as soon as the uh, counterinsurgency operation against the Kurds began in the mid-'80s, remained high, uh, escalated in the 90s, more or less as atrocities escalated, uh, peaked in 1997, uh, in the single year of 1997, uh, Turkey got more arms than in the entire Cold War period up to the counterinsurgency combined. Uh, in fact, Turkey ended up being the biggest uh, uh, recipient of U.S. arms in the world outside of um, Israel and Egypt, not for Cold War reasons as long after the Cold War, uh, not for reasons having to do with the Middle East, but in order to slaughter and repress its uh, domestic Kurdish population. Well, in Diyarbakir, as everywhere, there was harsh condemnation of the September 11th atrocities, uh, but they don't overlook what I just described as easily as we do. Let's move a little bit to the south, uh, to Lebanon and the Palestinian refugee camps. Uh, there, too, there was strong condemnation of the atrocities, but it was mixed. Uh, many of them remember, in fact, everyone remembers the murderous invasions through the 90s, supported strongly by Clinton. Again, hundreds of thousands of refugees, uh, hundreds of people killed. Uh, and there are very few who could possibly have forgotten 1982 when the invasion killed about 20,000 people, uh, half destroyed Beirut. None of this was in self-defense. Uh, that's at last being quietly conceded in the United States, at least in the case of the 1982 war. Uh, the first recognition that I've seen uh, is in a recent column by James Bennett in the New York Times, January 24th, column on another topic. But if you look in it, he says, he's their Middle East correspondent, he says the goal of the 1982 invasion was to install a friendly regime and destroy Mr. Arafat's Palestinian Liberation Organization. That, the theory went, would help persuade Palestinians to accept Israeli rule in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. That's quite accurate. Uh, it was, in fact, 20 years ago already um, openly called in Israel a, a war to, for, the, for the occupied territories, and it's quite important. These facts were reported extensively in Israel 20 years ago. They've previously been accessible here uh, only in dissident literature. Of course, all of this was carried out with the decisive uh, military and diplomatic support of the Reagan administration. Well, 
all of these things are extreme cases of international terrorism, if not the more severe crime uh, of aggression, the major war crime. But let's give the benefit of the doubt to Washington and assume that it's only international terrorism. It surely satisfies the official U.S. definition of terrorism, which was uh, formulated at the same time, the early 80s, uh, that is, the calculated use of violence or the threat of violence to attain goals that are political, religious, or ideological in nature. You go back to James Bennett's description of the U.S.-Israeli invasion of Lebanon, fits that case, that definition precisely. Uh, furthermore, by far the more, most extreme acts of terrorism, international terrorism, uh, in the region uh, in those years, the 1980s, were either U.S. initiated uh, or U.S. backed, and that included the peak year of international terrorism, 1985. It was picked as the peak story of the year. Uh, these facts are misrepresented here in a most astonishing and revealing way. I'll come back to it if you like, uh, but the facts are quite clear. Uh, you may recall that President Reagan's a special envoy to the Middle East who was more or less in charge of all of this it was a gentleman named Donald Rumsfeld, who's now running the military component of the current war on terror. Uh, Reagan's ambassador to Honduras, who supervised the international terrorist operations for which the United States was condemned by the World Court, is John Negroponte, who's now running the diplomatic component of the current war on terror at the United Nations. This is hardly ancient history. It bears rather directly on the current phase of the war on terror that was declared by the Reagan administration 20 years ago when it took office uh, with much the same rhetoric as today and was and the same personnel uh, and was conducted in ways that may easily be forgotten here uh, but are not forgotten by the victims. Uh, you can do a little research project to see how well they're remembered here by just seeing how often any of this is brought up in the reams and reams of paper uh, that have been devoted to the war on terror since September 11th. Uh, and that's an interesting insight into ourselves, the most important topic. We can learn more about the current phase of the redeclared war on terror by considering how the current uh, international terrorist atrocities are regarded right now. Not ancient history like the 80s, but uh, the current ones. Well, in fact, there is a lot of scholarly literature now on terrorism, big topic, and in it there is some reference to the 1980s. So if you take a look at, say, uh, the journal Current History in December, good journal devoted to terrorism, uh, they discuss scholarly articles, discuss the mention the 80s as an era of state-sponsored terrorism in which the United States played a proactive role against terrorism, meaning international terrorism sponsored and run by the United States is a proactive role against terrorism. Uh, Orwell would have appreciated that. In Turkey, in April 2000, the State Department issued its annual report on international terrorism, and it singled out Turkey for, I'm quoting, for its positive experiences in countering terror. Uh, it also picked out Algeria for its positive experiences, one of the worst terrorist states in the world. And the third one that had positive experiences was Spain, not as bad as those two, but hardly very pretty either. So they had positive experiences in countering terror by carrying out some of the worst terrorist atrocities of the mid and late 1990s uh, with crucial U.S. support. It was the lead story in the New York Times reported by Judith Miller, who's their specialist on these topics, with no comment about what it meant. Uh, in the current scholarly literature, our war on terror, I'm quoting, uh, has no better friend and ally than Turkey, thanks to the capabilities of its armed forces demonstrated in its anti-terror campaign. Okay, if uh, Milosevic were an ally, uh, he would not be standing before uh, an internal court for facing war crimes trials, uh, rather, he'd be uh, praised for the success of his anti-terror campaigns, and he would be chosen to lead uh, new ones, and much like Suharto was one of the great uh, killers and torturers of the late 20th century. Uh, he was praised in the mainstream as a moderate who's at heart benign as the blood was flowing, and he was hailed as our kind of guy by the Clinton administration, 
uh, shortly before he was overthrown by popular rebellion. Actually, the U.S. ambassador in Pakistan is using the same words for Pakistan's dictator today. Turkey is grateful for uh, U.S. support, for the support that you and I gave, decisive support for its campaign of murderous state terror, uh, as incidentally it was called uh, accurately by Turkey's Minister of Human Rights and by very courageous uh, Turkish intellectuals, uh, among them a prominent sociologist who spent much of his life in prison for recording the fact. Uh, he actually rejected an award from the Fund for Free Expression here uh, because of U.S. support for Turkey's murderous state terror. Uh, in gratitude for uh, Clinton's enormous contributions to massive international terrorism, uh, Prime Minister Echevit was the first to offer troops to fight the war on terror in Afghanistan. Uh, and now Turkey has just been selected uh, to serve as the force to protect Kabul from terrorism funded by Washington. Uh, there are others, too, who happily enlist on the war on terror. Uh, so no one's more enthusiastic than the Russians, uh, who are eager to have U.S. support for their own monstrous crimes in Chechnya, or the brutal dictator of uh, Uzbekistan, who's also our kind of guy right now. Well, again, Orwell would have been open-mouthed in astonishment uh, as all of this proceeds, evoking little comment. But if we want to break convention and have a look at what we're doing, uh, we can learn a lot about the war on terror and more generally about the effects of September 11th on policy. Well, let's move to today's headlines right now. So take Israel. Sharon is a man of peace, as the president just described him. Uh, despite an impressive record of terrorist atrocities, includes large-scale massacres of defenseless civilians back in the early 1950s, a uh, brutal expulsion of thousands of Bedouins 20 years later under the labor government, destroying their lands, mosques, cemeteries, driving them into the desert uh, to clear northeast Sinai for Jewish settlement, the background for the 1973 war, and including, of course, the 1982 war fought in Lebanon, killing 20,000 people uh, in order to secure uh, Israeli control over the occupied territories and other atrocities, all of them international terrorism, uh, because they rely crucially on U.S. support since the 1970s. And the last few weeks, horrible as they are, are nothing all that new. I personally saw similar things firsthand uh, in the West Bank uh, during the first Intifada, 1988. Uh, in this attack, the uh, most ferocious and destructive weapons that destroy the Janine refugee camp and the ancient uh, Kasbah, the old city in Nablus, uh, in ways reminiscent of the Taliban, if you look closely. Uh, the most ferocious uh, weapons were U.S. helicopters supplied in the full knowledge that they're going to be used for those purposes. There's no doubt about it. Uh, it's a pretty ugly story. It bears retelling, involves Clinton I'll come, and the U.S. media, including our, ours right here. Uh, I'll come back to it if you like. Uh, furthermore, the U.S. government remains active right now in uh, enhancing terror there, I'm borrowing the president's words. So in December, last December, uh, the Security Council uh, debated a resolution calling for the implementation of the Mitchell Plan and the dispatch of international monitors to oversee the reduction of violence. Uh, that's the most effective means, as is generally recognized. Uh, such efforts are routinely blocked by Washington. Again, this was vetoed in, on December 14th. Uh, that particular veto happened to be taking place during a 21-day uh, period of calm. Uh, that means that only one Israeli soldier was killed along with 21 Palestinians, including 11 children, and 16 incursions into areas under Palestinian control. Ten days before the U.S. veto, there was a conference in Geneva, important conference, uh, which the U.S. boycotted and therefore undermined, uh, a conference that once again concluded that the Fourth Geneva Convention applies to the occupied territories. Uh, that entails that virtually everything that the United States and Israel do there is a grave breach of the Geneva Conventions, meaning a war crime of unusual severity, grave breach uh, under U.S. law. 
The conference, which included the European Union, even Britain went along, specifically declared that the U.S.-funded Israeli settlements are illegal, and it condemned, I'm quoting it now, it condemned the practice of willful killing, torture, unlawful deportation, willful depriving of the rights of fair and regular trial, extensive destruction and appropriation of property, carried out unlawfully and wantonly. They're not talking about the last couple of weeks. This is December 5th. The United States is a high contracting party of the Geneva Conventions, and therefore it is obligated by solemn treaty to prosecute those who were responsible for such crimes, including uh, the U.S. leadership uh, going back 30 years. The United States has not officially withdrawn its recognition of the applicability of the Geneva Conventions to the occupied territories, nor has it withdrawn its official censure of Israeli violations as the occupying power, I'm quoting George Bush the first, uh, when he was UN ambassador. In October, and that remains official policy, uh, in October 2000, the Security Council reaffirmed the consensus on this matter. It called on Israel, I'm quoting, called on Israel, the occupying power, to abide scrupulously by its legal obligations under the Fourth Geneva Convention. Uh, remember, that excludes just about everything that's happening there as a war crime. Uh, the vote was 14 to 0 means it becomes international law. Uh, the zero is because of one abstention. Clinton abstained, uh, presumably not wanting to veto one of the core principles of international humanitarian law, particularly in the light of the circumstances uh, in which it was enacted in 1949 uh, in order to criminalize uh, formally the atrocities of the Nazis in occupied territories. Well, all of this is another significant contribution to enhancing terror, all the more so because it's scarcely reported. The Geneva Conference, in fact, wasn't reported uh, and very quickly consigned to the memory hole, uh, which is already uh, amply furnished with our own uh, quickly forgotten crimes. Uh, the, uh, none of this, however, is forgotten by the victims. Well, yes, September 11th was a horrifying atrocity. Unfortunately, it's not new. What's new is the direction in which the guns are pointing. For the first time in the history of Europe and its offshoots, that is us, uh, they were the victims, not the perpetrators of horrifying crimes of this nature. And that's a historic event. Uh, why was it carried out? Second question. Well, here we have to make a distinction between two groups. One is the actual perpetrators. I assume, as everyone else does, that it's either al-Qaeda or something very like them. Uh, and why they did it uh, is uh, there's no one who knows that the answer to that any better than the CIA, uh, which recruited them, uh, armed them, uh, trained them, uh, directed them to cause maximal harm to the Russians, and not to help the Afghans, which would have been a legitimate objective. The same special forces that are chasing them around in Tora Bora uh, a few years earlier were training them to carry out uh, terrorist atrocities. And they did. Uh, the, they carried out, during the 80s, they carried out terrorist acts within Russia, which were pretty serious, uh, almost led to a Russia-Pakistan war at one point. Uh, that all ended in 1989 when the Russians withdrew. Uh, they didn't stop their terrorism against the Russians because they love Russians, they hate them, uh, but rather because they had achieved their objective, which was clear and explicit. Uh, the objective was to drive the infidels out of the Muslim lands so that they could initiate their own reign of terror, as they immediately did. Uh, in 1990, they turned against the United States for essentially the same reasons. From their point of view, the United States is occupying Saudi Arabia, even much more significant than occupying Afghanistan for them. Uh, their own terrorist record goes back 20 years to the time when the CIA and British intelligence uh, and its allies organized and trained them. Uh, in 1993, they made their first attempt to blow up the World Trade Center. Uh, actually, they had much more ambitious plans. Uh, the, the, yeah, I'm sure you know there was a Dutch government inquiry into the Srebrenica atrocities. It was just released last week. Uh, from it, we learned that at the same time that they were trying to blow up the World Trade Center, uh, U.S. C-130s, were flying uh, radical Islamist mujahideen from Afghanistan uh, to the Balkans 
uh, also Iranian-backed uh, Hezbollah fighters, uh, and also a huge flow of arms going through Croatia, which took a substantial cut. Uh, they were there to support the U.S. side in the Balkan Wars, while Israel, uh, Ukraine, and Greece were arming the other side, uh, which explains why unexploded mortar bombs landing in Sarajevo, Sarajevo sometimes had Hebrew markings, quoting a British political scientist reviewing the report that was published last week by the Dutch government. Uh, well, why are radical Islamists attacking the United States while continuing to work as its agents? I think there's every reason to take them at their word on their answers to this, as the scholarly literature does, and I suppose uh, the world's intelligence agencies as well, roughly what I just said. So that's the perpetrators. Uh, but then there's another very relevant population, uh, a population in which bin Laden's uh, horrendous words have a certain resonance. For example, uh, the moneyed Muslims, as they were called by the Wall Street Journal, uh, when it surveyed the attitudes of wealthy Muslims on September 14th, right after, a couple of days after the World Trade Center bombing. Uh, that means banker, they were interviewing in the Middle East uh, bankers, uh, lawyers, other professionals, uh, managers of multinationals, uh, some of whom uh, described bin Laden as, in their words, the conscience of Islam, uh, even though they despise him and they fear him. Uh, they fear him for good reasons. They know that they are his primary targets. Uh, they are very strongly supportive of U.S. policies in general, but very bitter about U.S. the U.S. role in the region. Uh, the, the re and they state their reasons. The Wall Street Journal, to its credit, reported them accurately. Namely, the U.S. supports corrupt and repressive regimes that undermine democracy and development. And then there are particular policies, such as the support for the uh, harsh and brutal uh, Israeli military occupation, now in its 35th year, actions that uh, devastate Iraqi civilian society while strengthening Saddam Hussein and others. Nobody surveyed opinions in the slums and rural villages, but if they had, they'd find similar reactions, but harsher ones, uh, because unlike the moneyed Muslims, the people there don't understand why the wealth of the region should be drained to the West and to local collaborators uh, rather than being used for the domestic population. Well, these attitudes, which are not exactly secret, provide some of the answers to George Bush's plaintive question, why do they hate us? And those who want to add some historical depth can easily do so. Uh, you can look back at the declassified internal record. So say back to 1958, which was a crucial year in U.S. foreign policy, in that year, there, and the records are declassified, in that year there were three major crises in the world. Eisenhower and Dulles, President, Secretary of State, insisted that there was no Russian connection in any of them, which is incidentally rather typical of the Cold War period when you look closely at particular cases. Uh, all three were oil producers. Uh, all three were is Islamic, Indonesia, North Africa, Middle East. Uh, but they were secular Islam in the three cases. In the Middle East, Eisenhower pointed out to his staff that, I'm quoting him, the problem is that we have a campaign of hatred against us, not by the governments, but by the people. Why? Well, uh, why? this is 45 years ago, not after September 11th. The National Security Council uh, explained, highest planning body, I'm quoting them, they said, in the eyes of the majority of Arabs, the United States appears to be opposed to the realization of the goals of Arab nationalism. They believe that the United States is seeking to protect its interest in Near East oil by supporting the status quo, that means corrupt and brutal governments, and opposing political or economic progress. And they point out that that perception is difficult to counter since it's accurate. Our economic and cultural interests in the area have led not unnaturally to close U.S. relations with elements in the Arab world whose primary interest lies in the maintenance of relations with the West and the status quo in their countries. So that we do follow and we should follow, and it will lead to a campaign of hatred against us. 
uh, much as the Wall Street Journal and others found after September 11th when they sur surveyed the opinions of the wealthy and the privileged who are closely linked with Western power and support its basic objectives. Well, it's easy to go on with this, and it's not hard to understand, but educated opinion here prefers a different story, the one you've read over and over. Uh, it prefers uh, ruminations about how they resent us because of our freedom and our love of democracy or because of their cultural failings, which go back to the Middle Ages, or because they've been left behind by the form of globalization in which they happily participate, and so on. And we can, if we want, choose self-serving fairy tales, uh, but it's not particularly wise, uh, nor is it wise to pretend that we don't know the answer to Bush's question. We do. It's very hard to miss. Well, those policies continue to be operative, uh, not only in the Middle East. Let's go back to Latin America. Uh, here, the policies are similar, and they are just as natural, to quote the National Security Council, as in the Middle East. And they're also deeply rooted. Uh, not a great surprise to Latin Americans or to people here who want to understand our own country, for example, by looking at the rich declassified record of internal planning. For example, you can look back to a hemispheric conference in 1945, which laid out the framework for subsequent U.S.-Latin American relations. In that conference in Mexico, the United States instituted what was called the Economic Charter of the Americas. And its goal was, and I'm quoting the State Department now, its goal was to counter the philosophy of the new nationalism that was sweeping Latin America. It's a dangerous doctrine which embraces policies designed to bring about a broader distribution of wealth and to raise the standard of living of the masses and holds that the first beneficiaries of the development of a country's resources should be the people of that country, quoting the State Department. And, of course, that's a serious misunderstanding. The first beneficiaries of a country's resources must be U.S. investors. Uh, we have to protect our resources, uh, as George Kennan put it, uh, top State Department planner. He was referring to the material and uh, human resources that by accident lie elsewhere but are ours. Uh, and as he made clear and explicit, uh, violence may be the only way. Uh, you may recall that Kennan was at the dovish extreme of the planning spectrum. Uh, he was removed in 1950 because he was considered too soft for this harsh world. And he's now revered as a great humanist. Uh, the threat of the new nationalism was overcome. The U.S. had the force to do it. Uh, one of the consequences was described by the World Bank just a few years ago. They pointed out that the region has the most unequal income distribution in the world, and there will be chaos unless governments act aggressively against poverty, which is appalling in its depth and scale. And that situation is expected to become worse. Last year, the U.S. intelligence community, with the assistance of uh, academic specialists and people from the business world, published their projection for the next 15 years. Uh, their projection is that what they call globalization will proceed on course, leading to a widening economic divide and greater financial volatility. Well, a widening economic divide means less globalization in the technical sense, of convergence to a single market, but more globalization in the doctrinally preferred sense of concentration of wealth and power. And more financial volatility, well, that means slower growth and even more harm for the poor majority. So that's the optimistic scenario. Uh, these predictions were a few months before September 11th. There's no indication that these tendencies of the emerging framework of world order. There's no indication that they're going to change, except in one, one respect, they're likely to become more pronounced, uh, with consequences as grave as the, those that the World Bank predicts. And they're very deeply rooted. They're not the kind of policies that change easily. You can get some further insight into the likely effects of September 11th by looking back a few years to the preceding moment. Uh, when it was widely argued that there would be a crucial turning point in world affairs, namely the end of the Cold War. Uh, that was definitively over by November 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, so, so what do we learn from that historic break? Uh, 
Well, I think if you look back now with 12 years, 13 years experience, uh, we discover primarily continuity. Some tactical modifications, lots of new pretexts for old policies, uh, but basically the same policies, the ones I've just outlined, which are indeed natural, just as the National Security Council recognized, uh, deeply rooted in our institutions and therefore persistent. So let's take October 89, right before the fall of the wall. Uh, a national security directive on the Middle East recommended continued support for our friend Saddam Hussein, uh, called for the use of military force where necessary and appropriate to defend our vital interests against the Soviet Union or any other regional power. Not Iraq, notice. Uh, a couple of weeks later, the Berlin Wall fell. A few months later, in March 1990, uh, George Bush, number one, sent the annual message to Congress uh, on the Pentagon budget, same as previous years, we need a huge Pentagon budget, uh, but now the pretexts were changed. So we still needed a huge intervention force directed at the Middle East, uh, where, I'm quoting, the threats to our interests could not be laid at the Kremlin's door. That's contrary to the preceding October and all the years before. In fact, the threats were exactly the same as they had always been, namely indigenous nationalism, just as in 1958, when it was internally conceded that there were no Russians, or in Latin America or Southeast Asia or Africa. In fact, if you look closely, consistently. Uh, so the policies, therefore, continue, but now it's not in defense against the Russians because they're not there anymore. Other policies remain intact as well. In March 1990, we still needed the enormous military system, not to deter the Russians, but in defense against the technological sophistication of third world powers. And it's necessary to maintain what they call the defense industrial base. It's a euphemism for high-tech industry. As before, the Pentagon system has to remain in order to provide a cover for the dynamic state sector of the economy that serves to socialize risk and cost while privatizing profit, and it shields concentrated private power from market discipline. It's a leading factor in economic development and in the creation of the so-called new economy, and it also has to be extended without substantial change. Same after September 11th, but just intensified. Well, back to 1990, military tactics did change. The Pentagon explained at the time that the international environment has changed from the targets being weapon-rich, that's a name reference to the Soviet Union, to being target-rich, that's a reference to the South, the rest of the former colonial world, where there are increasingly capable third world threats. It's the Joint Chief of Staff at March 1990, uh, quite in conformity with the public message to Congress. Uh, targets are now going to, to include nations capable of developing weapons of mass destruction. Well, who are they? Uh, any nation is capable of developing weapons of mass destruction if it has some laboratories, uh, a little bit of industry, uh, some infrastructure, so that's just about everyone. Uh, the South is to be specifically targeted, uh, as indeed had been true throughout the whole Cold War period, but now uh, new options are available because the deterrent is gone, so we can do it more openly and uh, uh, with less, um, fewer devious means. Uh, nuclear weapons remain the centerpiece of U.S. strategy, but now enhanced uh, to include the, what are called mini-nukes, which are tailored for use against rogue elements, and these change now and then. So in 1988, shortly before, uh, Nelson Mandela's African National Congress was designated officially as one of the most not more notorious terrorist organizations in the world, uh, while South Africa was a valued ally, uh, having killed only uh, a million and a half people in the surrounding areas, forget South Africa itself, just in the Reagan years. That was part of the war on inter against international terrorism, which is now redeclared by the same people. A few years later, that calculation changed, and the recent past goes right down the memory hole, uh, teaching us absolutely nothing. Returning to post-Cold War planning, Clinton's strategic command recommended that nuclear weapons should be used when needed in what they called preemptive reaction. 
leave it to you to figure that one out. But uh, even if they're not used, they cast a shadow over any crisis or conflict, so they must be available and visible to adversaries. The U.S. must also move on to placing offensive weapons in space. It's in violation of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which has so far been observed. And at the U.N., it's been reaffirmed in the last few years, the U.S. and Israel abstaining. It's being reaffirmed because everybody knows the U.S. is planning to violate it. And for good reasons, which are clearly explained in Clinton-era documents of the Space Command, they point out that in the past, navies were created in order to uh, protect commercial interests and investments. And space is the next frontier, and we are powerful enough to monopolize it. War planners, furthermore, accept the same projections as the intelligence community. They also anticipate a growing gap between what they call the haves and the have-nots as the preferred style of globalization proceeds. Uh, Therefore, it follows that we need enormous destructive power in space uh, on hair trigger alert uh, in order to control the uh, unruly uh, have-nots who are going to be extending with globalization. Well, these Clinton-era documents go on to give quite a chilling analysis of the intended future. They're actually not very different from the recently leaked uh, nuclear posture review of the Bush administration, which created a considerable stir when it was leaked to uh, military analyst William Arkin a couple of weeks ago and published. Uh, The difference in reaction raises a number of questions, but I'll put that aside and keep to the main point, which is that the basic policies remain stable. Uh, through two recent critical moments, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union and September 11th. The primary effect of the redeclared war on terror has been to provide the United States with a major military base in Central Asia for the first time. Uh, That puts the U.S. in a strong position to dominate the uh, energy resources of Central Asia, but also, and I think more important, it complements the intervention system that's aimed at the far richer Gulf oil reserves. That goes from Guam to the Azores, but the closest nearby base up until now was the island of Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean, from which the population was expelled. Uh, The British courts have since accepted their pleas, British Island, uh, their plea that they have a right to return, but there's a higher authority which overturns that decision. The next target in the war on terror is supposed to be Iraq. According to Bush and uh, Blair and Clinton administration officials and others, we cannot tolerate Saddam Hussein because he is so evil uh, that he committed the ultimate crime. He even used chemical weapons against his own people. Uh, Those charges are completely accurate. Uh, They're missing only three little words, namely, with our support, uh, which continued without any change for years after the ultimate atrocity. He's also charged with uh, seeking to develop weapons of mass destruction, which I presume is probably true. But that charge also omits a slight fact, namely that the U.S. and Britain uh, continued to provide him with the means to develop weapons of mass destruction well after his worst crimes, when he was a far greater danger than he is now. All of that means straight out that we can't possibly take these official pretexts seriously, and anyone who even repeats them is just saying, I'm a servant of power and a total hypocrite. Uh, But uh, uh, there are more obvious reasons. Uh, There are reasons. I mean, there are reasons and obvious reasons to overthrow the old friend and trading partner of George Bush the first. Namely, he's sitting on the largest oil reserves in the Middle East uh, after Saudi Arabia. And one way or another, the United States is likely to try to regain control over them and the post-September 11 circumstances to provide a window of opportunity. However, the project faces several problems. Uh, The most fundamental one, I think, is trying to find an an acceptable successor regime. And that's not simple. The successor regime has to meet some conditions. It cannot allow any democratic tendencies, because if it does, the Shiite majority uh, might influence policy towards accommodation with Iran, and the U.S. doesn't want that. And furthermore, the Kurdish minority might gain rights that would threaten 
uh, U.S.-backed repression of Turkey's Kurdish population, which remains very severe. That issue is not a new one. It rose in April 1991, right after the Gulf War. At that time, a Shiite rebellion took place in the south, which might have overthrown the monster, uh, but the Bush administration intervened. It refused to allow rebelling Iraqi generals access to uh, captured equipment, and it authorized Saddam to use military helicopters and other armed means to drown the rebellion in blood. Uh, Later, Stormin Norman, who was in charge, claimed that he'd been snookered by the devious Saddam. Uh, He hadn't realized that when he authorized him to use air power, he would actually use it. The basic problem at that time was explained by Thomas Friedman, who was then chief diplomatic correspondent of the New York Times, so he's articulating State Department concerns. Uh, He pointed out that the best of all worlds for the United States would be an iron-fisted Iraqi military junta ruling Iraq uh, just as Saddam did, uh, much to the pleasure of U.S. allies Saudi Saudi Arabia and Turkey, and of course the boss in Washington. But since clones couldn't be found, the U.S. was stuck with second best, namely Saddam himself. Well, that problem still remains. Uh, Currently, the State Department and the CIA are reported to be developing contacts uh, with Sunni Iraqi generals, recent defectors, and they might be suitable replacements as clones. But here there are some problems, too. The favorite, General Khazraji, who's Saddam's former chief of staff, uh, he may not be able to make it to a planned meeting in Washington in a couple of weeks because he's under investigation in Denmark for war crimes charged with participation uh, in the gassing of the Kurds at Halabja, so some difficulties. Another problem is one that's all over the front pages, namely strong regional opposition, even from Kuwait, which, of course, has been exacerbated by the recent U.S.-Israeli operations uh, in the West Bank. And they are joint operations. Uh, That's well understood in the region, uh, even if a different story is preferred here. The story preferred here is that uh, I already mentioned uh, Washington's renewed steps last December to bar the obvious measures to reduce violence, and it takes considerable discipline Uh, not to see what seems obvious to commentators elsewhere, particularly in the Middle East, namely that Powell's mission was very carefully crafted to ensure that the man of peace uh, would have time to complete uh, his terrorist operations in the newly occupied Palestinian cities. Now, it's true that the president insisted that he must withdraw without delay, But Powell was uh, quick to explain in a press conference right away that the words without delay mean as soon as possible. He kind of recalls uh, Clinton's deliberations on what is means, which you may remember. Uh, The man of peace uh, is not asked to renounce terror, and of course the master in Washington. Rather, it's the adversary who's imprisoned by Israeli tanks unable to flush his toilet, uh, he has to renounce terrorism in terms acceptable to the master, even though everyone understands that those statements are completely meaningless, have no effect whatsoever. Uh, Why? Well, the story is familiar. Again, it's useful to look back a bit. Powell, who's the administration's good guy, is following the model of Secretary of State George Shultz, who was the official moderate back then. Uh, in the Reagan years. This at a time when the United States was becoming an object of international ridicule in the late 80s because of its unwillingness to hear that the PLO was calling for negotiations and political settlement with increasing intensity, while the United States and its Israeli ally were refusing on the alleged grounds that the PLO had not renounced terrorism, unlike, say, the United States and Israel, which can't carry out terrorism by definition. In his memoirs, Schultz recalls all this with pleasure. He describes how he informed the president, President Reagan, that Arafat had said unk, 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 and kol, 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 but he hadn't yet said uncle with sufficient humility to be acceptable to Massa. The purpose is humiliation and degradation, not of Arafat specifically, but of the Palestinians as a whole, for whom he's a national symbol, 
and they have to be taught that they cannot lift their heads in standard Israeli parlance. Twenty years ago, during another one of the periodic uh, outbursts of state terror in the occupied territories, a very respected centrist commentator in Israel, Yoram Perry, wrote that 15 years, that's what it was then, 15 years of occupation have taught Israeli soldiers that the task of the army is not only to defend the state and the battlefield against foreign enemy, but to demolish the rights of innocent people because they are Arabushim, living in territories that God promised to us. Arabushim is the Hebrew word that's the equivalent of niggers or kikes. Uh, he and others were horrified and not only by the vicious brutality, but also by the techniques of humiliation. For example, writing identification numbers on arms of prisoners on the day of the Holocaust, which is a practice renewed in the past few weeks, again arousing horror. Uh, ten years before that, Moshe Dayan had informed his cabinet colleagues that the Arabs must be told that they will live like dogs in the hope that they will leave. And ever since then, the U.S.-Israeli practice has followed the advice of uh, one of the leaders who was actually most sympathetic to the Palestinian plight. Well, none of this breaks new ground. These are familiar elements of domination and repression. Humiliation and degradation are at their core. comes second nature to anyone with their boot on someone's neck. It's well known to anyone who's studied the history of imperialism and conquest and it's not at all surprising that the United States and Israel should now be infuriated uh, by their loss of a monopoly of violence and terror, though by virtue of their power they remain well in the lead. Well, the official justification for the perpetuation of many years of repression and terror is that the Palestinians rejected the magnanimous and generous offer of Clinton and Barack at Camp David in the year 2000, so they deserve their fate. And there's a simple way to evaluate that claim, very simple. Have a look at a map, okay? Unfortunately, it's a difficult task to carry out because none were published, which is interesting. It's not that it's hard to publish map. You want to know if the offer was magnanimous? Take a look at the map. That'll tell you. It's easy enough. I mean, they were published in Israel, in the Israeli press. They were published in marginal publications here. And unless there's something to conceal, uh, they would have appeared regularly on the front pages here, uh, along with the chorus of self-praise about our magnanimity. And a look at the maps reveals very quickly why they did not appear. It is true that the clinton Barack offers registered some progress. At the time of the negotiations, Palestinians in the West Bank were confined to over 200 isolated cantons, uh, and the magnanimous offer reduced it to four. Uh, therefore, it approached from below, remember. It approached from below the moral level of South Africa in the depths of apartheid 40 years ago when the first Bantu stands were established. Uh, Bush and Powell have regressed even below that. Uh, they are offering no more than a vision of what South Africa actually implemented 40 years ago. There's also been no change in the intentions, which are openly announced, described by Barak's chief negotiator at Camp David, Shlomo Ben-Ami, one of the architects of the Camp David Accords and a dove in the Israeli spectrum. Uh, he explained, uh, just before joining the government in 1998, he explained the intention of the Oslo process, namely to create a neo-colonial dependency for the Palestinians in the occupied territories with permanent dependence on Israel, meaning the U.S.-Israel alliance. So Bantu stands. Uh, and the analysis is correct, uh, and it should have also made headlines right along with the unpublished maps and along with the actions which were taken at the time to drive the point home, the final clinton Barack year. In that year, settlement programs expanded to their highest peak since 1992, pre-Oslo, uh, under Sharon. Well, you take a look at history, it again reveals the continuity of policy. So right now there's a great deal of interest in the Saudi peace plan which was adopted by the Arab League in March. And this is regularly described here as a historic opportunity if only the Arab states will at last accept the existence of Israel, as in fact they have repeatedly done, uh, along with the PLO, since January 1976, when they joined the rest of the world in backing a Security Council resolution which called for a political settlement, uh, 
based on Israeli withdrawal from the occupied territories with, I'm quoting it, appropriate arrangements to guarantee the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence of all states in the area and their right to live in peace with insecure and recognized borders. So that's, in effect, UN 242, the basic document, uh, amplified to include a Palestinian state. As usual, the resolution was vetoed by the United States, which is a double veto. It vetoes it from history. Similar initiatives have regularly been blocked by Washington right to the present. Uh, A majority of Americans also support the political settlement that is now reiterated in the Saudi plan. But unless they undertake a research project, Americans cannot know that the primary barrier to the diplomatic settlement that they support happens to be the Washington-Israel alliance, as it's been for 25 years, actually longer if we look closely. Well, unless this changes, and that means changes right here, the prospects there are for dissent into even more bitter tribal warfare with ominous consequences that are likely to spread well beyond. Well, finally, looking back over quickly, very quickly over a longer stretch, at the end of World War II, The United States had a position of global wealth and power that had no analog in human history. With the reconstruction of other industrial societies, the U.S. share of global wealth declined from about half after the Second World War to about a quarter by the 1970s. That's the time when the major critical change in post-war policy took place, namely the post-war economic system was dismantled and the uh, current uh, neoliberal framework was established. It's been accompanied for the past 25 years by deterioration in major macroeconomic indices, apart from countries that didn't follow the rules, and a notable attack on the substance of democracy. These are important topics, but I can't go into them now. Well, by the 1970, the world had become economically tripolar, with roughly comparable centers in North America, Europe, and East Asia, but it was militarily bipolar, U.S. and Russia, and each of the superpowers imposed constraints on the other. And the Cold War conflicts, which were, of course, violent and destructive, were within the domains of the superpowers. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the world became unipolar militarily, remaining tripolar economically as it is now. A couple of years ago, uh, Harvard political scientist Samuel Huntington wrote in the main establishment journal, Foreign Affairs, that much of the world, he seemed to imply most of the world, considered the United States to be a rogue state, the greatest threat to their existence, possibly a reasonable estimate, and possibly more so today. It can also be reasonably argued, I think, that the evolving system of state corporate power based in Washington's threat to its own population, us, The tendencies that lead in that direction are very real. They're not inexorable, and there are others that strongly counter them. Well, if you look over the centuries, uh, there's been significant expansion in the realm of freedom and justice. There are periods of regression, but the cycle is generally upward. As always, human affairs are scarcely predictable. Very little is understood, and too much depends on will and choice. The emerging framework of world power should not be an object of detached contemplation, but has to be forged by dedicated work and struggle, always based on an effort to dismantle doctrinal constraints to see what's before our eyes, which is not really very deeply hidden. Hi. Could you talk about the U.S. participation in the recent uh, coup against the Venezuelan president, including including the active involvement of Otto Reich and Elliot Abrams uh, back from the Reagan years, and also about the removal of the in- Brazilian ambassador to the organization against the proliferation of chemical weapons? Let, let's take one, I if can. we can. Okay. Like, 
couldn't hear right. most of it. Uh, as far as Venezuela is concerned, I mean, you know, I don't know any more than you do, just what was in the newspapers. The Everyone was expecting, for years, everybody's been expecting a military coup in Venezuela, kind of like the coup in Chile. Uh, the only question is when. You know? uh, that there have been plans for it, uh, I don't think we can seriously doubt. Uh, when the military coup took place, it was immediately welcomed in Washington and in the editorials and everywhere else, you know, a wonderful thing. However, something very surprising happened. There was a popular upsurge, and the uh, the generals and the president they'd imposed had to back off. Meanwhile, the Latin American countries had condemned the coup. I think Canada went along with the United States, if I'm not mistaken. But the Latin American countries went along, opposed the coup on grounds that it was unconstitutional, an attack on democracy. They don't like Chavez, but they were in favor of democracy. However, the northern democracies, and certainly the United States, and I think Canada, thought that the overthrow of democracy was just fine. And then when the when it was restored, they were kind of embarrassed. And then comes the cover-up, you know, in which you read that the United States was secretly telling the generals, this is not nice, and you have to follow constitutional procedures, but so secretly that you can't find any record of it. Well, you can make of that what you like. The U.S. is embarrassed by its open opposition to democracy in comparison with Latin America, and it has to cover up, and there'll be a cover-up. But my suspicion, like everyone else's, is there'll be another coup, unless Chavez is really tamed. You know, unless he's willing to follow U.S. orders. Okay, over here. Hi, Professor Chomsky. I did take a look at the maps. Um, I'm sympathetic to most of what you say, but I'm just curious. I read uh, a long uh, analysis by Shlomo Benami of the talks, and it seems that like by the point they reached Taba, there was, with exchange of territories and something, something between 97% to 100% with compensation on the table. Um, and Benami's complaint there was that uh, Arafat refused to come back with a counterproposal. Well, there's one problem with it. Yeah, I read the same things. Uh, first of all, remember that Taba is six months after Camp David. Mm -hmm. It was January 2001. It was informal discussions. And what happened to the Taba, we can talk about what the Taba agreements were, and we know a lot about them, because there's a report by the European observer, Martinos, uh, approved by both sides, which describes in detail what the report, what they were talking about. So I can go into that if you like. But it's kind of academic because they were called off not by Arafat, but by Barak. Okay, Barak called them off. Okay, so there were informal meetings in Taba, which did make some progress beyond Camp David. But if you take a look, the major issues were still there. Are you Israeli? Uh, my mother is. Okay, but you know, you re know this business, you know the country and that sort of thing. Okay, well, the main thing, the main issue was what happens to that big salient east of Jerusalem that breaks the West Bank into two and includes the city of Maal Adumim, which was established by primarily the Labor Party and Clinton in order to bisect the West Bank. And they were still divided over that, uh, one of several issues. Uh, the, and the exchanges of territory were meaningless. It was pieces of the desert. However, I agree with the point. I mean, there could, there, wa there was progress in the informal meetings in Taba, though there were huge problems, uh, and they might have made, gotten somewhere if Barack hadn't called them off. Hi. Consistent with U.S. foreign policy, there seems to be a two-faced policy in regards to China. On the one hand, we're becoming closer and closer to them as a trading partner, and on the other hand, we're beginning to demonize them as our next great superpower to build up our arms race against. Uh, I'd like to hear what you have to say on that subject. Yeah, policy. I think you're right. I mean, policy towards China is kind of ambivalent. They're a major investment, a region for investment and trade. As China moves into the World Trade Organization, uh, the West hopes that it's going to subordinate itself to Western investors, kind of like Mexico, uh, which would be a huge boon to U.S. agricultural exporters, uh, to uh, you know financial institutions which expect to take over the Chinese direction of the Chinese economy. Uh, this is probably going to wipe out about a couple hundred million Chinese peasants. Nobody knows what will happen to them. So there, that's the upside. You know, on the other hand, the downside is that they remain a nationalist country. Uh, which, with their own concerns and might pursue their own objectives, uh, they're not going to invade anybody, but uh, uh, it's, a, it's a powerful force that might be part of an independent Asia. 
uh, China and Japan together, uh, especially Japan and its surroundings, but now also China, in principle, could be um, the dominant economic force in the world. They probably have the largest uh, financial reserves in the world right now, and they don't, they're not a military force, but that can change. So, yeah, that's concern, just like there's a concern over Europe going its own way. So it's mixed, okay. pretty much like you said. Hi, Professor. Um, some commentators say that we have to wait for a new generation of leaders in Israel to even begin to achieve peace. Even with a new generation of leaders, do you believe it's possible to even achieve peace within the Middle East? Could you comment on that? Do I agree? No, I think the main problem is right here. I think the main problem is right here. It's very easy to blame other people for the terrible things they do, right? So you can look at all these bad people in the world and they're doing all kind of awful things. In fact, there's a new literary genre that's developing, which is very widely hailed in the United States. Uh, you can read, you know, laudatory reviews in all the main papers. It's about, uh, it's a series of books, one by the head of the um, Human Rights Center at Harvard, which do talk about a flaw in the American character and therefore are extremely courageous. Uh, the flaw is that we somehow don't respond properly to the crimes of others, okay? You take a look at those books and the laudatory reviews and the indices and so on, you notice there's a slight gap. How do we respond to our own crimes? Well, that you can't ask, okay? So you can go as far as saying, well, we don't respond properly to the crimes of others, and that's an enormous act of courage, and we laud it, and so on. Uh, but what about the vastly more important question about ourselves? And the same is true here. Uh, there will not be, I mean, uh, th there's conflicting groups inside Israel right now, and, and there will be in the future. Uh, but those who want to move towards a peaceful accommodation are not going to get anywhere unless they have support in the United States. And so far, the United States has, for 25 years, insisted on blocking peace. Remember, the Saudi peace plan, in essence, was proposed uh, at the Security Council 25 years ago, blocked by the United States. The U.S. vetoed the similar plan again in 1980. Uh, it blocked, along with Israel, blocked similar Saudi plan in 1981. Right through the 1980s, it was blocking uh, uh, PLO and the Arab state and European initiatives, more or less of the same type. You take a look at the General Assembly records where there's no technical veto. Year after year, from the mid-70s up till the 90s, uh, there are regular votes uh, every December session uh, on similar proposals with numbers like, you know, 150 to 2 U.S. and Israel. Sometimes they pick up you know, Dominica or something, Micronesia. But uh, that's what's been going on. Uh, the, uh, there's great uh, praise for uh, Baker, who was very forthcoming, Secretary of State for uh, George Bush. You can read it in the Christian Science Monitor this morning, big review of the uh, so-called peace process, lauding Baker for really going very far. The only thing it doesn't mention and is never mentioned is the Baker plan. That is the official U.S. policy in December 1989 called the Baker Plan. You can read it in the State Department bulletin, uh, which endorsed, I'll tell you what it said, it endorsed the coalition position of the Israeli government, that's Shamir and Paris, their position, which has never been published in the United States except in the dissident literature, but it is the Baker Plan. Uh, their position says, first, there cannot be an additional Palestinian state between Israel and Jordan. What does additional mean? Well, it means there already is a Palestinian state, namely Jordan, and there can't be an additional Palestinian state between Israel and Jordan. Second, uh, the status of the occupied territories called Judea, Samaria, and Gaza will be determined according to the guidelines established by the Israeli government. That's point two. Uh, point three is there w we, we will allow free elections under Israeli military rule, uh, and though they didn't mention it, with uh, tens of thousands of Palestinian intellectuals in jail. Well, that last point did get some mention here, showing how forthcoming we are and how much we love democracy. Uh, but the first two, but not, didn't describe it the way I just did. You know, I said free elections, isn't that wonderful? Uh, but uh, that's the Baker plan, which is now being lauded as tremendously forthcoming. Uh, in fact, there just isn't an exception. Uh, you take a look at the whole record, 
It's a formal. It's, these are not secrets. You know, you don't have to go to declassified records for these. This is all public material. There's simply no deviation from that position. I mean, on paper there is. Like you can read Jimmy Carter in the, the New York Times a couple of days ago, saying, "Yeah, we all want. Uh, we all agreed. In fact, he even says Begin agreed on Israeli withdrawal from the occupied territories in 1978." I mean, if he believes that, I, I, you know, you just have to have pity on him. What Begin said in 1978 is, we're not going to withdraw from the occupied territories. We're going to settle them. You want to pay for it? That's fine. Uh, and Carter did. In fact, USAID Israel went up to half of total USAID. Now, maybe Carter believes he heard Begin say, I'm going to withdraw, but he certainly didn't say it, and he certainly didn't act on it. Now, until that changes, there will be no opportunity for political leadership to develop in Israel that will try to implement these purchases. Professor, I think you've done a marvelous job of deconstructing American foreign policy and a lot of the myths that are used to rationalize it. I wonder if you could talk some more about where we go from here, where the Israelis go from here, where the Palestinians go from here. Oh, can we just pick one? I, I just well, talk about us. I, I mean, let's talk about, let's Palestinians talk about the United States. States. Well, I, I think yeah. I, if I can just make a brief comment, I think you would find that in all those constituencies, a vast majority of the population out of fear, in some cases very justified, feels that all the actions are, are justified in terms of self-defense, which 9-11 sort of underscores for most Americans. Well, I'm not interested in giving lectures to Palestinians and Israelis. I mean, when I'm in Tel Aviv or when I'm in Birzeit, I tell them what I think they should do, but I'm here, okay? So I think we should ask what we should do. Uh, what we should do is very straightforward and simple and within our reach. First of all, break through the, do the doctrinal constraints, which are rigid, and find out what's going on. Okay. Uh, once you find out what's going on, well, you maybe agree that I'm right or you may think I'm wrong, but whatever it'll be, you'll at least know what's going on when you look at the maps and so on. And if what I said turns out to be more or less accurate, uh, it's clear what we ought to do. We ought to uh, change U.S. policy so that it no longer is the major impediment to peace in the region. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a pretty con it's a pretty conservative view. You know, it means taking the position of the majority of the American population uh, and even the formal position of the U.S. government saying, okay, let's do it. And we know how to do it. Uh, there's no, uh, Israel will respond to what the U.S. says. Uh, they have to. They have no choice. Uh, and they always do when the push comes to shove. Uh, if there's any resistance, you just make a hint that maybe we'll suspend the arms shipments for a little while. Uh, but there's no real need. Uh, if the U.S. agrees to accept the long-standing international consensus on this and the position of the, its own population, yeah, you can move towards uh, the kind of settlement that everyone more or less agrees is the only short-term possibility some kind of two-state settlement on the internationally recognized borders uh, with all the wording that I just repeated from the 1976 declaration that comes from UN 242, the rights of both states in the region, the peace and security, and so on and so forth. The Palestinian state would certainly be disarmed. Uh, there could be some border adjustment, you know, mutual adjustments. There might be some territorial trading. Uh, these are all technicalities. Uh, the main thing is to agree to the general point uh, that there can be a viable Palestinian state. Unless that's agreed to, there won't be any progress, and the U.S. has so far totally refused that. 